boys and girls, I'm going to read the final chapter of By the Great Horton Spoon titled Arrival at the Long Wharf. So in our last chapter, Jack and Praiseworthy had struck it rich on their claim. Praiseworthy beat the mountain ox in his fight. And now they're ready to head on back to Boston and see if they're not too late to save Aunt Arabella's home. All right. The following morning, Praiseworthy and Jack climbed aboard the stage for Sacramento City and were given a rousing send-off. Time was running out. Now that they had struck it rich, they had better hurry back to Boston before Aunt Arabella sold the house with all of its family memories. But lately, Praiseworthy found himself thinking less and less about Boston and more and more of Miss Arabella. She would like California, he thought, and of course, she ought to be finding herself a husband. A man would be lucky to have her at his side. If only he weren't a butler, but that was unthinkable. He quickly forced the thought out of his head. Jack was almost disappointed when they came down out of the mountains and arrived in Sacramento City without even a glimpse of a road agent. He had been ready at any moment to draw his four-shooter. A steamboat was waiting in the river. They bought tickets and went aboard with their heavy pouches of gold dust. Sacramento City drifted away behind them, and in 14 hours, they would be in San Francisco. The captain, they learned, was trying to break his own speed record. 14 hours or less, he chuckled from the pilot house win window. Gentlemen, hold on to your hats. The small stern wheeler went charging down the river, blasting its whistle at anything that got in its way, even floating logs. Kanaka sailors kept pitching cordwood into the furnace, and on deck the passengers amused themselves watching the needle rise on the steam gauge. 45 pounds pressure and still rising, a miner from Poverty Hill chuckled. Why, we'll trim a full hour off the river record if we don't climb up on the sandbar first. Another passenger shook his head. It seems to me we could use a little less steam and a little more caution. Praiseworthy and Jack were weighted down with treasure. They carried their pouches of gold dust securely tied to their belts with the revolvers bristling in the sun. Praiseworthy lit a long nine cigar and they sat behind the jack staff watching every bend in the river approach. Fine looking country, Praiseworthy would say from time to time. Fine looking country, Jack would agree. He sensed how much his partner hated to leave this rough untamed territory. No one in Boston would think of referring to Praiseworthy as bullwhip and Aunt Arabella would put a stop to Jack's coffee drinking but Boston was where they belonged. They were not the only miners aboard who were heading for home. They met passengers who had abandoned the diggings in disgust, as poor as when they had arrived. Some, standing for months in the chill streams, had picked up nothing but the rheumatism. Still others, like Praiseworthy and Jack, had struck it rich and their belts and pockets were heavy with gold pouches. The two partners slept in everything but their boots. When they awoke the next morning and went out on deck, the stern wheeler was entering the broad blue stretches of San Francisco Bay. The masts of hundreds of ships could be seen in the distance, cluttered around the port. We might get ourselves passage home today, said Jack. Might, said Praiseworthy, every day counts. We've got to reach Boston before Miss Arabella does anything foolish. The passengers were gathering around the steam gauge again and someone called out, 58 pounds pressure and still rising. At that moment, with the long wharf less than a mile away, the boiler exploded with a roar and the smokestack shot in the air like an arrow. The pilot house followed with the captain still inside, shouting out orders. The explosion lit up the day and blew a hole in the bottom of the ship. Passengers were pitched over the side as if shot from slingshots. Praiseworthy and Jack were among them. The next thing Jack knew, he was underwater, and the gold pouches, heavy as lead, were pulling him down. He fought to come up, but the weights kept dragging him below. Then, fighting for his life, he unbuckled his belt. Buckskin pouches and four-shooter fell away into the deep. Seconds later, he bobbed to the surface. He spit water and looked around. The riverboat was gone. So was praiseworthy. But a moment later, his partner appeared breaking surface about 10 feet away. Jack felt a quick throb of relief. He wiped the wet hair out of his eyes. Hang on, partner, said Praiseworthy, shoving over a splinter plank of wood. 
Are you all right? Ruination, cried Jack. I, I unbuckled my belt. Praiseworthy's whiskers were running with seawater. Think nothing of it, Jack. I had to do the same thing. Within ten minutes, there were several boats alongside fishing passengers out of the bay. When Praiseworthy and Jack landed at the Long Wharf, they were not only as penniless as the day they had arrived, but soaking wet to boot. They had struck it rich, but their fortune was somewhere in the deep of the bay. Gone forever, Jack muttered softly. But Praiseworthy was undaunted. Mere bits of colored metal, he grinned. We have our good health, damp as it may be at the moment. The captain gave us a very expensive berth, you might say. They wouldn't be returning to Boston with their pockets full of gold nuggets, but return they must. Aunt Arabella would need them even more now with everything at home sure to be lost. They had hardly climbed up the boat stairs to the wharf when Jack noticed the Lady Wilma still riding at anchor. Strange, said Praiseworthy, Captain Swain had planned to sail home as soon as he could unload. Maybe he'll let us work our passage back, said Jack. A first-rate idea, remarked Praiseworthy. Without delaying even to dry out, they borrowed a skiff and rowed to the Lady Wilma. Once alongside, they shipped their oars and Praiseworthy raised his hands to his mouth. Hello, he called. There came no answer. There wasn't even a sound from the other ships at anchor nearby. It was as if they had rowed into a graveyard of sailing vessels. Finally, they climbed aboard and looked around. The crew is gone, said Praiseworthy. There's not a soul on deck. It's spooky, said Jack. Praiseworthy shouted up at the pilot house. Captain Swain! There was no reply except from a cat sunning himself on a rotting mound of canvas. Soon another cat appeared from the folksale hatch, and when Jack looked up, he saw a cat walking along one of the yard arms. There's nothing here but cats, Jack said. Those cats from Peru. And they appear to have multiplied, Praiseworthy nodded. They went searching through the ship, and everywhere they looked were Peruvian cats and kittens. When they peered into the hold, they saw the cargo still there, waiting to be unloaded. Rats had gnawed into barrels of smoked fish, and the cats had fattened themselves on rats and fish. What has happened here? Praiseworthy mused. It looks like Captain Swain has simply abandoned his ship. He scratched through his whiskers. Left it to all these cats. A yellow kitten was winding itself around Jack's legs, and he picked it up. This morning they had pockets full of gold dust and nuggets. Now they couldn't pay their fare home. He wondered how they would ever get back to Aunt Arabella and Constance and Sarah. Strange, said Praiseworthy again. They returned to the skiff and Jack put the kitten in his shirt. They tied up at the long wharf and walked into town and tried to find Captain Swain. Instead, they found Mr. Azaria Jones, the Yankee trader. He was standing outside in an auction tent beside a barrel of free pickles. Confound it, he said with a hearty laugh. I recognize the boy, but is that you behind the whiskers and the red miner shirt? It's me, said Praiseworthy. Help yourself to the pickles. I've become an auctioneer. You have had bad luck in the diggings. You might say so, said Praiseworthy. Help yourself to the pickles. You look hungry. Thank you, sir, said Jack. I am. What happened to Captain Swain and the Lady Wilma? asked Praiseworthy. The same thing that happens to almost every other ship that comes in here with the gold fever. His crew ran off to the diggings. Why, there are more than 200 ships out there rotting at anchor. Deserted. Captain Swain couldn't even hire enough men to unload his cargo. Finally, he just gave up in disgust and got himself a passage home. Have a pickle. Is Dr. Buckby still in San Francisco? asked Praiseworthy. He tried a pickle. Not him. He got over the fever and gave up on that gold map of his. I heard he was horse doctoring somewhere up the river. Doing fine, too. Me? I'd be doing fine if the rats don't put me out of the cheap John business. Town's full of them. Why, a man can hardly stand still at night without something beginning to gnaw on his feet. Blame it, I just got hold of some flour from Chile and the rats are stealing me blind. Rats, said Praiseworthy. Did you say rats? remarked Jack. Mr. Azaria Jones nodded. I auctioned off a cat yesterday for $15. Cats, said Praiseworthy. 
Did you say cats? remarked Jack, pulling the kitten from his shirt. Mr. Azaria Jones clutched the kitten as if it were a nugget of gold. Praiseworthy gave Jack a wink and looked Mr. Azaria Jones squarely in the eye. Why, I can safely say that Jack and I can supply you with an unlimited supply of ratting cats. Just provide us with a couple of bags and we'll be back. The cat auction drew such a crowd that the street was almost blocked. Every storekeeper needed a ratter and the bidding was spirited. Midway through the auction, the signal on Telegraph Hill announced the arrival of a sailing vessel, but hardly a soul left the auction. By late afternoon, Praiseworthy and Jack had a clink of gold pieces in their pockets. Their share of the cat money ran to almost $400. They wandered toward the long wharf to see about passage home. The sailing vessel had dropped anchor and now passengers were coming ashore. Suddenly, Jack stopped. He saw a young girl in a dark traveling dress that reminded him of his sister, Sarah. Beside her was a taller girl who reminded him of his sister, Constance. Beside them was a woman in a straw hat and green eyes who looked exactly like Aunt Arabella. It was Aunt Arabella. Jack could barely believe his eyes. And then he realized that even Praiseworthy had stopped in his tracks. But the women and the two young girls passed them by as if they were total strangers. Sarah, Jack cried out. The smallest girl turned. Constance, Jack exclaimed. The other girl turned. Miss Arabella, said Praiseworthy. The woman turned. And then suddenly, despite the disguise of jack boots and rough red miner shirts and the slouch hats, she recognized her nephew and the butler who had left Boston so many months before. Jack, Jack, my dear, cried Aunt Arabella. There was a shout of joy and they rushed back toward each other. Jack was engulfed in arms. Praiseworthy stood at a slight distance behind and then wiping an eye with her handkerchief, Aunt Arabella straightened and smiled and said, hello, Praiseworthy. Hello, Miss Arabella. You're so changed, both of you. Yes, Miss. I'm delighted to see you, Praiseworthy. I'm astonished to see you, Miss Arabella. And Miss Constance and Miss Sarah. Suddenly, they were all talking at once. We sold the old house, said Constance. Soon as we could, said Sarah. It was so big and so full of musty old memories, Aunt Arabella said, smiling now. When we discovered Jack's note on the tea service, that the two of you were running away to California, the girls and I couldn't wait to follow you. It was time to rid ourselves of that house, of the past, it's like being free of a curse. Oh, let me look at you. Did you find gold? Sarah blurted out. Plenty of it, Jack said proudly. And I drink coffee now. Coffee? exclaimed Constance. They call me Jamoka Jack in the diggings. How dreadful, Aunt Arabella laughed. She turned back to Praiseworthy, regarding him with a green-eyed twinkle. And what do they call you? Bullwhip, miss. Ooh, how fearful. What has happened to your black hat and coat and umbrella? Gone. If clothes make the man, as they say, Miss Arabella, I suppose I'm a miner now. Perhaps it's time I shed the past myself. You make a very striking miner, it seems to me. And Aunt Arabella smiled. Out here, one man is as good as another. Only more so, said Jack. Aunt Arabella stood very straight. I've always believed it. Will you be returning to Boston? asked Praiseworthy. Huh, certainly not. That changed everything, and Praiseworthy crimped an eye just like Pitch Pine Billy. Then he scratched through his whiskers. In that case, he stopped to gather up his skirt. I, I mean, yes, said Aunt Arabella. If I'm no longer a butler, uh, what, I, what I'm trying to say is, well, in California, we say a thing straight out, and Arabella smiled. Then do stop beating around the bush, praiseworthy. You see, yes, I, I mean, women are scarce out here, Miss Arabella. Before you can walk a block, you're going to have ten proposals of marriage. How delightful. What I mean to say is, yes, he cleared his throat. Oh, maybe this is the time or the place, Miss Arabella. But when a man strikes gold, he doesn't lose any time staking a claim. With sudden decision, 
praiseworthy whipped off his hat. His mouth was as dry as cured salmon, but he kept talking. If there's going to be any proposals of marriage, I intend to be the first in line. I've got no vices to speak of, although I have taken to smoke and strong cigars. To say it right out, Miss Arabella, will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? Constance and Sarah began jumping up and down on their toes. Oh, do, Aunt Arabella, we know you gave him your picture a long time ago. He carries it in his shirt pocket, Jack exclaimed. Aunt Arabella was smiling through a wet sparkle in her eyes. Marry you? Why, of course. I thought you'd never ask. By the great horn spoon, praiseworthy gasped. Jack had never seen him so flustered. He stared. Constance stared. Sarah stared. Suddenly, Praiseworthy gave the three of them a grin. Youngsters, if you don't stop staring, I'll take a hairbrush to you. Jack was delighted to hear it. He went on gaping and so did Constance and so did Sarah. And Arabella held her straw hat against a gust of wind. Then we'll be going back to the gold fields with you, won't we? Oh, it's no place for women and children, said Praiseworthy. We'll make it a place for women and children. We could build a cabin, said Jack, like Quartz Jackson. Perhaps we could at that, Praiseworthy said. On some hill within sound of the river, he thought. Why, he might even bring along a law book. He could read it at night. The diggings could use some book law, and a man had to think of making a future. Praiseworthy put Aunt Arabella's hand in the crook of his arm, and they started walking up the long wharf. They looked very much like a family. They felt like a family. They were a family. The end. All right, so even though he didn't get his gold, looks like Jack and Praiseworthy still struck it rich. I hope you enjoyed the book.